Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Although where I am right now, it's good morning, but good afternoon to, I think, most people connected. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce our speaker. I believe possibly, is this, uh, Blanca, is this our last seminar for this, for this academic year? Uh, our fine in our final seminar from the Infolex Research Group. I think most of you recognize my voice. I'm Janet DeCesaris, and I'm very happy today to introduce our speaker, my very good friend, Professor Pius Ten Hacken from the University of Innsbruck. Uh, Professor Ten Hacken has had a very long and storied career in many fields that I that are very dear to my heart, namely linguistics, lexicography, terminology, and translation studies, where he his work is has been important in, in all four of those fields. Uh, one I met Professor Ten Hack and I think for the first time approximately 25 years ago at a Eurolex meeting, undoubtedly, because that's where we always met, either that or at the uh, the translation the translation lots uh, duo that between Maastricht and and Lodz that concentrated on translation studies where we participated for many several times. And I think one of the reasons I enjoyed listening to Pro Pro Professor Ten Hacken on so many occasions is that he's one of the few people who understands that theoretical linguistics has something to offer people who do a very practical job of writing dictionaries. And I say one of the few people because one of the things that I, I soon discovered when I became interested in dictionary structure is that most of the people working in lexicography and perhaps also in terminology did not have the same sort of linguistic back linguistic studies background that I had. And I was actually surprised to find that out because I thought, well, everyone will have a PhD in linguistics and they all read the same sort of thing I did. And that actually wasn't true, except for Pius Ten Hacken, with whom I've had many, many great conversations about generative linguistics, systemic linguistics and how how linguists should look well could look at dictionaries in a different light and how lexicographers and terminographers would benefit from understanding more in theoretical linguistics professor ten hacken has a very long uh, list of publications, which I will not go into, but they are in all four fields, several books that he has edited, numerous journal articles, as uh, most recently in the, um, as there's a special issue that he and his, his often co-author Renata Panakova uh, edited on neology and word formation in the International Journal of Lexicography. Of the many papers and books that Professor Ten Hacken has in his CV, I would, one, I'm, one review of all things I'm very fond of is his review of English morphology, which is a book that I think I, it's fair to say he and I both had very high expectations for. And to some extent, that book, although it's very good and, and quite interesting, maybe to some extent doesn't meet all of our, ex did not meet all of our very hot, possibly too high expectations. But that's, I think, an excellent, that particular review is very good at bringing together Professor Ten Hacken's view on linguistics and, and morphology. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful review. I highly recommend it. Without further ado, because if I went on to talk about Professor Ten Hacken's over 100 pu publications, his long teaching career in Switzerland at the University of Basel, in the United Kingdom at the University of Swansea. He originally is Dutch, has a wonderful edit, um, linguistics background at the University of Utrecht. Uh, I would go on for the 45 minutes that he's going to talk. So without further ado, Pius, 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for this um, kind introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, word formation today. And um, my idea is to outline a way of looking at word formation, a way of doing word formation that highlights some aspects that are generally not um, given due notice in the generative tradition. Um, so I will start to say something about how um, word formation is studied in the generative context. Um, and as you know, generative linguistics is first of all, the theory of syntax. So the gold standard is um, how we treat syntax with rules of syntax generating sentences where at some point lexical insertion take, takes place to have a real sentence that you can pronounce. Now, when generative linguists look at morphology, they try to do the same uh, as they do for syntax. So um, they have rules of morphology that are a bit like rules of syntax, and they generate complex words instead of sentences. But in the same way as for the syntax, we also have lexical insertion um, that takes place in the application of these rules. Um, of course, the complex words that come out of this uh, process can then be used in sentences. They can also be used in further morphological generation. The general idea of such a model is then that we have rules of syntax that uh, determine what is a grammatical sentence and rules of morphology that determine what is a possible word. Um, what I will show is that this is not perhaps the best way of looking at word formation, that in this way, uh, certain crucial aspects of word formation um, cannot be explained. In order to do that, let's first have a look at how language is realized in uh, the empirical world. So, for instance, here when we have a speaker, there are two places where we have language. Language as the stored expressions uh, in the speaker's mind and language as the produced expression, the spoken expressions, uh, but of course it can also be written, um, what the speaker does with language. Um, in the stored expressions, we have the building blocks for the utterances and in the spoken expressions, what I uh, want to distinguish here is the spoken expressions before they are uttered and after they are uttered. Because um, before saying something, you have a complete meaning for the sentence associated with it. So you have a kind of interpreted performance um, with the interpretation attached to the sentence. Whereas afterwards, you only have the acoustic signal. And the acoustic signal doesn't contain any interpretation. Um, it can only be interpreted if someone knows the language and builds up the, the interpretation themselves in processing the acoustic signal. So um, typically, we think of words as uh, stored expressions and sentences as spoken expressions. This is, of course, a fairly crude generalization because what is taught can be anything from uh, words, even parts of words, to sentences or even full sentences. So if we memorized uh, the Lord's Prayer, that's also something stored as an expression. 
still generally sentences uh, among the, the spoken expressions and words on the, uh, among the stored expressions, but possible words should be seen as um, in this category of the spoken expressions. They are generated by rules rather than retrieved from the mental lexicon. Of course, possible words can go to the uh, mental lexicon when they are lexicalized. Now, lexicalization is um, um, a concept that in generative linguistics is used um, in two different ways, and uh, they are connected, but it's important to distinguish them. Here we see one way of doing this. Lexicalization stores possible words in the lexicon, but it is understood that um, when they are stored, these words can then uh, gain specialized meaning. And a very simple example of this is the English uh, rule for uh, producing agent nouns with ER, which can lead to an agent, as in the case of hunter, or to an instrument, as in the case of toaster. Whether it is an agent or an instrument is then determined in lexicalization. So um, the model uh, with a bit uh, with, um, taking into account what I've added to it in the past slides is now we have rules of morphology generating complex words. In doing so, there must be lexical insertion. The complex word is at first uh, has the status of a possible word, but it can be lexicalized and uh, become a real word, which means on the one hand that it is being stored, and on the other hand that it gets a specialization of its meaning. One crucial aspect of um, the treatment of word formation in generative linguistics that is not on this uh, slide and this uh, diagram is blocking. And blocking means that sometimes um, we do not get the possible words that we expect. For instance, a simple example, um, you have the adjective shallow, which means not deep, and we can use the not deep, but we cannot produce the morphological expression undeep, which would be a possible word, but it's blocked by the existence of shallow. This is um, at the same time one of the um, main points where morphology and syntax are different. In syntax, we don't have blocking. In morphology, we do. So in generative linguistics, we have uh, an emphasis on possible words. These possible words have a meaning that stems from the word formation rule and the specialization to an actual meaning takes place in the course of lexicalization, or perhaps afterwards. First it's stored and then it gets it's specialized. And blocking uh, determines that certain expected complex words are in fact not possible. Now, um, I, or I should rather say we, developed a um, uh, slightly different model, and I would like to present uh, some of the main features today where word formation is seen as a naming device. This is actually the title of a book that is currently uh, in press. So um, 
It is uh, a joint monograph by me and Renata Panotsova, and it will appear uh, early next year at Edinburgh University Press. Uh, they already have the full manuscript, but they are now uh, producing um, a book out of that. So some of the ideas that uh, we present in uh, this monograph, I will now uh, present to you. And if I uh, then say we, it is not um, the, the, the royal plural, it's just uh, me and Renata. A central uh, point in our approach to word formation is that word formation is normally used for naming. And um, an example of naming we can see in the word dormen. Dormen um, may have different meanings depending on which uh, English speaking country you are at. But I um, take a British view on this. And in Britain, the dormen is something like this. Um, in the Collins Cobild dictionary, this is uh, defined like this. We have a dormen as a man who stands at the door of a club, prevents unwanted people from coming in, and makes people leave if they cause trouble. So the idea is someone who uh, guarantees the security of people by making sure that only uh, trusted people are inside the club so that they can enjoy uh, the facilities there. And this is what you uh, see nicely illustrated in this picture. Um, he looks like a uh, friendly and um, at the same time quite firm if you don't want, uh, if he doesn't want you to uh, get in or if he wants you to leave, then he will probably get his, get his way. Now, when we look at the definition, so uh, Colin Scoville makes, uh, um, uh, presents these full sentence definitions. I um, reduced it here to a more classical definition. Um, when you look at uh, the, the definition and compare it to the form, you see that only a very small part of the meaning is expressed. We have door and man, and all the other meaning, the club and the whole thing he does, um, even the standing, is not expressed in the form dormant. Um, this is a choice uh, that uh, British speakers of English have made, um, and uh, it is not determined by the concept. We can see this very easily by looking at a translation equivalents. In German, you have the same type of role, so I'll keep the same definition as a starting point, but uh, the form is now, tür is door, and stehen is stand. So here we have a slightly different perspective than in the, the English dormen. Um, here it is the verb that is um, expressed rather than that it's a man. It's literally doorstander. In other languages, for instance, uh, Dutch and Slovak, we have a completely different uh, view on the concept. Uh, in Dutch, uitsmeiter, and also in Slovak, piratovac, we have um, the function um, that is highlighted. Uitsmeiter is literally an um, outthrower or something like that. And piratovac has the same. Uh, meaning, literal meaning. So here we don't have anything like door or standing or man. It is uh, the function that counts. Now, 
let's have a look at how we would have to account for the meaning of dormant when we take a generative perspective. Uh, accounting for the form of dormant is not so, not so difficult. We have a rule of compounding and uh, this forms dormant out of door and man. Um, that's simply a word formation rule. At this point, dormen is a possible word. And we don't have a precise view of what dormen should mean. We've generated a form, but the rule of compounding only says a dormen is a man who has something to do with doors or with a door. Um, and for Türsteher or Uitsmeiter, the Hadzebach, we would have a completely different starting meaning. But all of them end up meaning the concept that uh, I showed you. A man who stands at the door of a club prevents unwanted people from coming in and makes people leave if they cause trouble. The transition from the possible word dormen with a very underspecified meaning to the meaning of dormen as the concept I showed you in this picture is what should be explained by lexicalization. Now, one of the things that is uh, strange here is well, where does exactly where exactly does this meaning comes from come from? If we think of lexicalization, do we actually first coin this word dormant and then consider what might it mean? It's a nice word. Let's let's start using it. What might it mean? What can we use it for? And how do we determine? How is it determined that the dormant actually has this meaning. We can, uh, of course, uh, use different sources to determine the meaning of dormant, but they have different levels of authority. We can uh, look at the speaker, we can look at the hearer, we can also look at the dictionary. And we have the signal. Now, about the signal, I can be very brief because the signal has no interpretation. The interpretation only comes when you start processing it. The meaning is not here. Now, what uh, does the hearer contribute to the meaning? Of course, in some sense, a lot, because she's the one who actually makes sense of this acoustic signal. But um, does she have the right meaning? Does she end up with the right meaning? How do we know? We can evaluate this against, for instance, the speaker's intention. So she doesn't determine what uh, the word actually means. Her interpretation can be evaluated. We might also evaluate her interpretation against the dictionary. Of course, dictionary uh, makers, lexicographers, always claim that their definitions come from the corpus. But the corpus is simply a signal. It doesn't have any meanings. So lexicographers can use a corpus, but they also use their interpretation of the corpus in order to come up with the description of the meaning. Still, um, lexicographers don't want to determine the actual meaning. They don't 
normally want to have this authority of saying what the word actually means, they always say that they simply reflect how people use the word. And this is again the speaker. The speaker selects which context, which concept she intends to name here. So it's the speaker who has the authority over the meaning of dormant when we want to uh, determine what it is that is meant, we can ask the speaker. And the words have then typically this uh, property of naming such a concept, serving as a shorthand, as a name for the concept, rather than as a description. It, the difference between description and naming is something you can uh, feel very easily <coughs> sorry, by looking at the contrast between the definition, which is a description, and um, a word, which is name. A man who stands at the door of a club presents unwanted people from coming in and makes people leave if they cause trouble is equivalent to doorman. But when we change something in the description, for instance, we replace door by entrance, nothing much changes. We still understand the same concept. When we do that with a word, feels very strange. Entrance man is not some established concept, and then it really feels a bit strange. What do you want to say with entrance man? And with names, we generally have the assumption in interpreting them that if it's a name that we don't know, it's probably a concept for which we don't have a name yet. So entrance man, will probably mean something different to Dorman. Now, I argued that um, a speaker, the speaker um, has the authority about over the name. That is to say, the speaker determines what a word means. And this represents uh, the area, the, the, the space in the speaker's mind where this process, these processes takes play, take place. What happens in naming and use of words? Well, the speaker has an intention. She thinks of a concept and wants to talk about it. So she comes up with a name for this concept. That is naming. And then um, such a name is stored in her mental lexicon. That is lexicalization. Once the, the name, the word is in her mental lexicon, she can use it and make it part of some intended performance, a sentence. And this intended performance can then be pronounced. And here it leaves the speaker's brain and becomes a, an acoustic signal that can be picked up by someone else who may try to interpret it. So what we see here is that in naming, we always start from the concept. And as you can imagine, once we have the concept as a starting point, the name will be the name for the concept. And this is a crucial point in determining what a word will mean. So naming 
is the selection of a name for a concept. And word formation is one of uh, three main mechanisms used in naming. The other two are borrowing and sense extinction. Um, the tolerance of uh, speech communities to new words um, coming out of word formation, borrowing and sense extinction is very different. So in some languages, it's much more easy to, uh, much easier to get a new borrowed word. Uh, in other languages, it's more appreciated to use existing words and extend their senses. And then there are languages like the German with its, ex its extensive compounding mechanism where uh, new words come up every day and nobody uh, worries about them as long as they are regularly formed. But in all cases, what we do in naming is creating a name for a concept that we started with. We started with the concept and therefore, whatever name we choose will have as its meaning this concept. This is what we call onomasiological coercion. The idea of coercion is uh, exploited also, for instance, by Pustyovsky, where you get um, a kind of um, forcing a word to have a slightly different meaning than it would normally have. Like in begin a book, where begin must be a process. A book is not a process. So you derive a process from book. For instance, begin reading a book or begin writing a book. Now, in onomasiological co coercion, you have the same, the same idea of forcing something into a related, similar way of uh, meaning. But here it is in the, with the purpose of naming. So when we look at onomasiological coercion as a central component, what comes out of our model as we had it for generative linguistics? Well, the first thing that falls is the idea of possible words. We are not interested in possible words because these possible words have no status until they become actual words. And the meaning does not derive after the form has been generated, but before. So there's, it's not a result of lexicalization. And the arrow here should actually be in the opposite direction. The meaning is the starting point, and then we get a form to match it. For instance, by word formation. That's on the masiological coercion. Then um, this word is lexicalized in the sense of being stored in the mental lexicon as a form meaning pair. So here we have a different view of how uh, word formation can be looked at from the perspective of naming. In order to expand on this, I will um, give uh, another example, but because it has been, it's getting dark here, I have to do something about the light. Before you stop seeing me at all. As a second example, I will uh, give you an example of a transposition. Uh, the example here is from uh, the BNC, and uh, the focus of the example is the word installation. Installation, as it is used in this example, 
is a transposition because it has uh, actually the same meaning as uh, a corresponding expression with a verb. So the installation in the territory of four military bases is the same as that foreign military bases are installed in their territory. This is quite typical of uh, nouns in Asian, but as is also typical, this is not the only meaning that they have. Here we have an example of a, uh, a different or related meaning where the soldiers uh, were taken to a military installation. And of course, this must be an object they, they were taken to. Installation in English is uh, very much uh, related to this um, idea of military installation. So we have on one hand the sense where installation is equivalent to the verb install, but on the other hand, we have something like this, an installation that actually designates the result of this action. Again, we can uh, uh, see how generative linguistics uh, deals with this, generative morphology. Um, it, in most theories, uh, it takes uh, install and Asian as two elements that it combines to uh, form installation. This is a word formation process leading to a possible word. And uh, for the action reading, where it is uh, equivalent to the verb, the possible word is more or less what we um, want to have. We don't need any further meaning there. For the uh, result meaning, we have something like this. And again, I give the common scope definition. Here, it's not a full sentence definition. A place that has been specially built by the Army, Navy, or Air Force to contain people or equipment. So this is the result of lexicalization. Now, um, I will also here, I would like to uh, go, uh, focus on a different language than English. Um, but I will tell you a bit more about this. And um, um, focus on the German installation. Installation is uh, formally, of course, very similar to English installation, but it is used in a different, uh, with a different focus most of the time. So the Duden Dictionary of German gives us its uh, first example, the installation der Heizungsanlage. So the installation of the central heating. And um, then the derived meaning, the result reading, is illustrated with uh, this eine veraltete Installation, an older or uh, obsolete, out of date installation. Um, in German, these words like with Aktion are particularly interesting because Aktion is not the only um, suffix that has this function. We have uh, action that produces nouns for the process designated by the verb, but we also have um. Uh, um is related to English, ing, but whereas ing in English has uh, is a semi-inflectional suffix in German, it's clearly derivational. And action is um, limited to those verbs that end in ihren. So uh, 
wo Installation in Germany have installieren as the verb. In this way, we can explain that sammeln, for instance, sammeln means collect, um, can be nominalized as sammlung, collection, but not as sammlation, because it doesn't fulfill the conditions for the rule uh, with action. But also not all verbs in Iren have a noun in action. For instance, modernisieren, modernize, has modernisierung as a nominalization, and modernisation <coughs> is not possible. <coughs> Here, in general linguistics, we have to say modernisation is blocked by modernisierung. We are not particularly convinced by this idea of blocking because it is basically a statement, a generalization. It doesn't explain anything. It just says when we have modernization, we cannot have modernization. And interestingly, this generalization breaks down when we look at installation. So, the Duden examples for uh, installation are the installation of the Heizungsanlage, in the installation of the central heating, and veralterte installationen erneuern, renovate old installations, obsolete installations. But installation is also possible. And this is unexpected. If uh, modernization is blocked by modernization, why would installation not be blocked by installation? Installation is also in the Duden dictionary. Sorry, this looks like this sounds like the passing by. Um, uh, installation is also in the dictionary, and we get the installation der Heizungsanlage as a completely possible example. However, veralterte installationen erneuern is not possible. So, what do we have here? Is this a kind of partial blocking? We notice that modernization is possible and blocks modernization. But in the opposite direction, installation does not block installation. Aronoff, in his 1976 uh, first discussion of blocking, proposes that in such cases, um, the um suffix is so uh, productive that it overrides blocking. But why would it then have fewer senses? That's not explained. And it not only has fewer senses, it also has a much lower fre frequency. When we uh, compare installation and installation in the Deutsche Referenzkorpus, Dereco, we notice that the frequency per million is uh, 10 times higher, more than 10 times higher for installation. So what exactly is going on? A first point to be uh, noticed here is that the two readings of uh, installation are one built up on the other. So in the first instance, the verb installieren gives rise to the noun installation in the sense of um, the verb, with the same meaning as the verb. And only in the second step do we get this installation, which refers to a thing that has been installed. 
And we can use this as a basis for explaining what happens with installieren. Consider the following situation. Here we have um, someone involved in a professional communication, probably a, a hospital manager, and she wants to say something about installing some piece of equipment. Now, the first word that comes to mind in German is Installation. However, Installation has also this other meaning of the equipment that is being has been installed. And because this meaning is actually more frequent, it predominates and it would be confusing for her to use Installation she would have to explain this, or she can just do something else, use a new word. Um, when she uses installieren, this is a word that is, was at first at least, not tainted by this second step of uh, referring to a piece of equipment. So it can be used in its regular, uh, primitive meaning of the process. And this is exactly what happens. Installierung has this process reading, but not the result reading. Therefore, we propose to um, assume so I'm closing the airport here. <clears throat> I propose to assume that um, when uh, word formation takes place, it is because we need the result of it. Word formation does not just uh, take place because it's fun uh, creating new words. We want to do something with these new words. This is what we call onomatological motivation. And it uh, encompasses what is uh, called blocking in generative morphology, but it explains this phenomenon. Because why don't we have modernization? Not simply because modernization is already there, but because there's no reason to uh, use modernization. We don't need it. And this is not the case for, in, uh, for, for installation when we have installation, because in some cases we can use installation in the process reading in order to emphasize that it is not the result reading. It's not a piece of machinery that has been installed. So in this way, I think we have made some progress in explaining what the result of word formation means. We don't have to resort to this general idea of lexicalization accounts for all specialization of meaning. The model we propose starts from the concept. So we have the lexicon and the word formation, but they don't do anything until we have a concept to start with. And the first point of call is, when we want to talk about the concept, look it up in the lexicon. Is there a word for this? And if there's a word for it, we use it. So word formation does not come into play. Word formation only comes into play when there is no existing word. Then we have the motivation, the onomatological motivation to come up with a new name. But because we started with a concept, 
we know already what the resulting word, whichever word we choose, will mean. That's the onomatological logical coercion. And so when we get a new word, it is motivated by a communicative need, and it has the meaning of the concept we started with. When we compare how this model relates to um, the one in generative linguistics, we see that the three assumptions that I started with characterizing the approach to word formation in generative linguistics, namely that it is about generating possible words, that any specialization of meaning results from lexicalization, after it has been generated, and that blocking accounts for the impossibility of certain words, they are not necessary in this way. We are not particularly interested in possible words. They have no real status. Um, they have... Um, Um, they have no meaning, they don't exist. Um, specialization is not something that happens to possible words after they have been generated. The specialization is already there and triggers the word formation in the first place. We don't do anything unless we have to name a concept. So when there is a need to create a new word and there's a naming need the meaning of the word that is created is already determined before we start but we only create a new word when we need one so um, we don't need a blocking principle the blocking principle is simply a uh, perhaps not completely adequate uh, formulation of the effect of this uh, idea that uh, unless we need a new word because we want to have a new name for a concept we don't start using word formation rules so in our concept-based theory of word formation there are two principles that uh, determine what's going on. On the logical motivation, we only generate words when we need them. And on the logical coercion, the meaning of the word we generate is determined before we start generating it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your very interesting talk. I have, I'm very glad that you mentioned that the use of Dorman was mm -hmm. British and not American, but because in American English, as Puce well knows, we say bouncer, but for the same concept that he referred to, which I think with an sense extension falls into function as you showed in yeah, Dutch yeah. and Slovak, as opposed to the British, the the British, but the the, the the British are different from Americans is something that I've known and Pius has known for a very long time. There are, uh, I'm sure there are questions and comments. Um, Blanca, I'm sure can can help me identify or people uh, can help me identify people here and um, give the floor. Yeah. No, no, I don't see any raised hands. But... Ah, but I have a question, then, <laughs> but I'd course. like so other people <laughs> I, to start I mean, first. I mean, I mean, so. Okay, so um, one of the, th as you finished your talk piece and you talked and you mentioned um, that 
new words, the sort of the idea of concept motivation. I was thinking of how do you deal with new word formations that might be considered slang, where there's possibly the concept exists in a strict sense of what the concept is, but the, possibly the register of use is different. And so does your idea of concept both entail the traditional view of concept, maybe from an Aristotelian point of view, or and does it also include things like pragmatic use? Because I see, having looked recently at a lot of the words or expressions, better is a better way to say it, that are listed in among the new words mm -hmm. in the journal American Speech, many of those expressions don't really refer to new concepts in in a non-pragmatic sense of concept, but they do involve inclusion of a pragmatic register that perhaps was not included previously. So if you could comment on that, thank you. Um, yeah, this is of course um, a crucial point in the uh, way that um, concept should be interpreted. Um, when do you need a new name for a concept? When you're not satisfied with what you have. And this can be because there's no name, name for it or because you don't like the name that is there for it. So um, it is the speaker who has this authority over the word formation component. It is not uh, some kind of dictionary um, it is also not the hearer, it's the speaker who determines whether they want to uh, create a new word. And the concept must indeed be more specific than um, the, the idea of um, the semiotic triangle, for instance, where you simply uh, try to match um, a thought with the reference in the outside world, because um, the concept also includes what you think about these references and how you um, conceptualize it in, in your mind. Mike back. Sorry, I had turned my mic off. Um, yeah, I, often I think, especially in because of the needs of, say, in terminology and the typical the typical context in which terminology is created, the idea of concept doesn't mm -hmm. actually, uh, I won't say deal with, but it, it's not often discussed in terms of register because register is not an important. Um, part of uh, it, the register is all the same, and so since it's since there isn't any difference in register in most contexts in which terminology is in fact important, then it's not a parameter that's typically taken into account. But I was just thinking that well, there's a lot of new, especially sense extension, and but also new word, literally new word formation in informal language or language that is possibly marginal in some sense. And that I, it seems to me that that fits, can be explained by your approach, but perhaps with a, a broader sense of concept that is typically understood in, in other parts of, of word analysis. But of course, um, in the case of terminology, this is only a kind of convention that applies to most languages and most domains, but it's mm. not general. Uh, in German, um, it's a well-known problem that uh, for the whole of um, medical terminology, you have um, a scientific register and um, 
uh, a general language register. Um, in most other languages, uh, you don't have both. So for instance, in translating from German, uh, from English to German, you always have to choose whether the scientific name as it's used in the Latinate name in English is rendered by a Latinate name in German as well, or uh, a sometimes very informal way of mm -hmm. talking about it, which may also be a term, and uh, in some cases is actually the normal term. So uh, this idea of not um, taking into account register in terminology is only relative. It's um, more typical, but it's not uh, exclusively what mm -hmm. we can I might also say that I think your approach does a very good job of a much better job than typical views of word formation and explaining extensive use of borrowing in specific domains. I'm thinking about use of Latin in English in legal, uh, in, in lots of fields, not just... It to it to some extent in medicine, but especially in in legal English, and the you people have on occasion tried to explain things only on the basis of well, this is a borrowing that's been then just accepted. But the idea of well, there's a name the that is in fact due to a naming function. I think is very interesting, mm -hmm. um, and represents. A, a contribution to what we know about about how new expressions become adopted by by speech communities. Yeah. This also applies to youth language, uh, for instance, because mm. uh, uh, young people don't are not happy with the words they, their parents use, so they come up with new words, and these words have some motivation. Mm -hmm. um, they may not uh, follow the standard word formation rules, but uh, they have some motivation, both in the form and in the meaning. Blanca, perhaps there are other people who want to ask something now? There are no no hands here. No mm -hmm. one has asked to to talk, but of course, if anyone is willing to say something, go ahead. You can just turn your microphone on and I don't know, maybe they are shy. <laughs> <laughs> um no further comments. I, I think there are no further comments here. Oh, okay. Well, I could go on with Pierce for a very long time, but that, that's that's <laughs> Pierce knows that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so well, we we'll we enjoy pleasure. each other's uh, each, talking about um, morphology and lexicology to a great extent. So, so uh, just to conclude, I very much like to thank Pius for accepting our invitation and concluding our series on uh, word formation, lexicography, lexicology, translation studies, which are all of, of interest to the Infolex group. And this very, I can't wait to read your and Renata's new book. I'm sure it will be great, just like everything else you've done together. So it will be uh, a a contribution to what we know about word formation. Thanks very much, Pius, for the talk, and hope to see you again in well, I don't know when in person. I, um, but hopefully soon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you.